to Thursday's Pack Now Connect. Today we're going to be talking about Black trans joy because we all need some joy. Um, and with us today is the fabulous, the famous <laughs> Naomi Entrell Jones. Uh, hi. hi, how you doing? Hello. I'm doing well, well, as well as well as we can be during this time. But hold on, in it. <laughs> So, Naomi, do you want to give us a brief intro just about who you are, what you do? Um, I am, I wear a lot of hats. I will say that um, I am a friend, a sister, a social worker. Um, I currently work at Children's Hospital, working in their prevention department, in infectious disease. I mentor a lot of people in the community. I'm just, how can I say this? I holistically love my people, so I'm wherever they need me to be at whatever time I need to be at. I know that's right. <laughs> so how are you doing with everything that's going on right now? You know, pandemic, uh, movement for Black It's life. so, like, disheartening. Like, every day you wake up and it's just, like, some senseless killing, and, and, and you don't know, like, we... It's like we're trying to fix a problem where we don't realize that, like, the system is the problem. And then the hardest part about me, uh, for me, during this time is realizing people's real views on you or people like you. Um, we have a lot of times where people feel like, oh, because you're my friend, I'm not this type of way. And it's really been shown during this time. And sometimes it's been some of those people that you've known for years and you built these strong friendships so that's been a really hard thing for me on this time or i heard that i know um especially in the time of social media because we're all like kind of separate like as people post and like facebook pulls in like what you like like so outside of the cyber world like what is social media like for you right now social media for me right now is like literally like life right now it's like we literally are living through each other's posts. So that's why a lot of times on social media, we don't realize that our voices on social media have so much more impact now because people don't see you in the community doing X, Y, and Z. They, they see what you're posting on social media. So if you're posting really, really hard things or horrible things, it speaks so much more about, it's like it speaks so much higher now because that's the only way we see you. Um, and it's the only way for us to keep up with some certain people. Like there's people that you, family you might have in different states and different countries. And it's the only way that you can be able to connect, especially during these times when people are not able to, you know, work and, and have those incomes and have that, you know, that ability to pay those high phone bills to pay, to talk to their families in these different places. So social media is like, I'm just um, 24 seven. It's bad. Like my social media is bad. I don't go to sleep till like four o'clock in the morning. On social media. TikTok is uh, literally it's all TikTok. I'm honest. Uh, it's all TikTok. I find joy in TikTok. I'm not on the TikTok. What brings you joy about the TikTok? Um, there's funny videos. There's like family videos. You see couples do funny videos. It's just like it's like for those 60 seconds. It's like a 60 seconds of pure joy. There's nothing like. Oh, I gotta think about that. Oh, whoa, Lord, that's so smart. It's just like those 60 seconds of those videos are just like funny. Just like I can take the world off. And somehow those 60 second videos turn into six hours of videos. And yeah, I told y'all I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> so today I thought it might be fun um, just because your background is giving me very vogue. Um, <laughs> Mother Naomi Campbell, um, behind the scenes. Of course, of course. <laughs> so we're going to play um, a little bit of a, a, brief, a lot of abbreviated uh, game of Vogue 73 questions. So um, we're going to talk a lot about joy, but we'll have some fun questions kind of mixed in there um, just to keep it fresh. So you cool with that? Okay, I'm down. So let's just start with like why we're all here today. What is joy to Naomi? Joy to Naomi is unapologetically happy it's 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 you know 
a, it's a mood, it's a vibe, it's a nothing's gonna ruin today. It's it's taking those little moments of like finding something happy in those little moments. So if it's you eating ice cream, it's like this is my favorite ice cream, and I'm going to enjoy this ice cream when I have this moment. Joy is literally taking that time to appreciate where you are, where you've been, and just be happy in it. And sometimes that's a mess, but be happy in that mess because it's your mess, and you're gonna build yourself out of this mess. But finding something to be happy about and it's being unapologetically happy about it. Okay. And why is joy important to you as a black trans woman? You have to, and I, and I can even go beyond just being trans or being black and trans. It, you have to find joy in this life because you will find yourself in these deep, dark places. And being black and trans, there's so many things that are against you, law enforcement, healthcare system. Um, people in our own community are killing trans women at alarming rates. So if we, if that's all we fester in and that's all we focus on, which we do have to, you know, take care of these issues, but if that's all you have to look forward to, you find yourself in these dark places and you resent people and you, it's just like you carry that hate and you, you can't do that. You don't want to do that. So I, I, I have to find joy in something. I have to find joy in my everyday because I gotta find something to keep me going. You have to keep refilling your cup. Mm, I like that, keep refilling your cup. Um, that kind of brings to my next question is like, what impact can self-care have on self-sustainability, like being black and queer and trans in America? Can you repeat that one time? Your phone kind of broke out. Oh, um, what impact can radical self-care and joy um, have on self-sustainability, living black and trans and queer in America? Can you hear it? Yeah. So being trans and being a black trans person, it's like, especially where the world is right now, we're being attacked on all this. We, it, we're in every one of those communities. We're part of the community that's being attacked because we're trans. We're part of the community that's being attacked because we're black. We, are, we have been thrown into men's prison and brutalized for years. No one just talked about it. So... In those times when you're facing all those things, and that's what we wake up to every day, you have to find things for you that just takes your mind off of it. Whether it's you go for a run, whether you're painting, you go for a walk, um, it's, you have to take your mind off all these issues because they're constantly happening. Every day we wake up, there's someone else who's died, or there's another trans woman gone missing, or there's another, and you don't know if it could be you. You don't know if it could, you, you never know. So in those moments where you're able to breathe, you have to find a way to. Absolutely. Describe your joy in a hashtag. My joy in a hashtag is a Birkin bag. No. <laughs> no, my joy, actually for me, I am a very, as, well, me and Matthew know, like, I love to cook and, like, cook for my friends and, we talk and we drink wine and things like that. That's one of the other things I missed so much before COVID. So for me, like joy for me, it's like it's just enjoying that time with the people that love me the most, who genuinely love me um, for my crazy, funny, lovable, sometimes off the wall stuff. Like those times I get to have those, you know, reflect back on old times, things like that. Those that's joy to me. Mm. Okay, it's so like hashtag community, hashtag Birkin bag community. <laughs> yeah, Birkin, Birkin in the community. Okay. Hashtag, hashtag that. I own the rights to it. I'm going to call my lawyer too. <laughs> so, if, what's your wake up ritual these days? You said what? What's your wake up ritual these days? My wake up ritual. Um, so, I wake up around like six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I watch reruns of TD Jakes. Um, either TD Jakes or uh, some um, Karen Clark cheered. Just to get me then in the morning. Uh, we start our meetings at 8. So I'm like, I, I, I get my stuff in the zone. And then I get ready for my first Zoom call or my first, you know, things like that. But 
just that centering myself and hearing, um, I know everybody has their different like religious, you know, thoughts and who they believe and things like that. But for me, that stuff that helps me center myself is just like hearing and, and just taking it in and yeah. Okay. So that's my mornings. I like it. I'm gonna circle back because I kind of jumped ahead, uh, but I wanted to continue off of your last answer. Um, when you talked about the things you miss um, because of COVID. So you talked about like having dinner and like wine with friends. How are you supplementing that connection during this time? Um, FaceTime has become, well, my phone overall has, has become very important in my life right now. Um, just because like now it's more of, I'm not having dinner, but we're going to have drink wine over the phone while I'll tell you about these crazy people I have to deal with today. Or I have to, you know, you tell me about what happened to you today, X, Y, Z. I mean, that's what my life has become. It's not the same, but it's getting us through. Um, yeah, but I still miss cooking. I miss cooking big meals. I, I cook a lot of food. You too. I miss it too. You know, I could use. <laughs> I bet. I bet. It <laughs> was always the first one there. <laughs> so, I think um, outside of that, like, how do you? How are you practicing self care? I kind of place joy and self care kind of together. You can separate them if you want, but like, how are you practicing self care right now? Uh, my biggest thing is learning to say no. Mm. Um. Especially like right now, um, I know me as well as some of my other sisters have been really, really hit hard with, um, you know, like doing interviews and doing all these things and speaking. And although we're great, we're, we're happy that, you know, some of these, these issues are finally getting attention, but at times it can be draining and you got to learn how to just take time for yourself. So I am proof to somebody, I am taking the weekend for me. Like this weekend, I'm taking the weekend for me. I'm getting me a hotel. I'm going to have me a spa day. I'm going to, you know, whatever I need to do to refill my cup because I cannot continue to do the work if my cup is on me. And there's so many of us. There's so many um, points of view. There's so many, you know, walks of life. And we have to give, you know, credit to those. So, I'm quick to be like, I can't do it, but you can definitely call one of my sisters. Mm. And I take that out for me because I just need to have that moment and have that time where I can cut the world off because you carry carrying all the hurt that's coming on in the world, plus trying to do work to fix, it, to fix what's broken or destroy what's broken and rebuild and bring something new to the table. And it's just like you're carrying that every day, plus your work, plus your family, plus X, Y, and Z, the cars and whatever, medical bills, it could be a lot. So just to learning to say no, learning to say like, no, I'm good. Thank you though for the opportunity, maybe next year. Mm. And if it was for you, it would, it would be there for you. If not, it wasn't for you. Mm. I think I'm off my own hashtag just because after you said that it reminded me of your <laughs> hashtag D&D, &D, do not disturb. That's my name. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> when that appears, uh, yes. I will hashtag D and D. Just so you know, do not disturb me. <laughs> if you disturb me and you get through, we don't have a problem. <laughs> it better be life threatening. <laughs> you do. Um, you brought up about like being asked to do so much during this time, especially in this like high politically, high political turmoil. Um, one of my favorite clips of you in these last couple of months was you in the Pride for Black Lives March. Um, can you tell me a little bit like what that experience was like for you? Um, there was joy on your face as I watched you in the crowd, you know? So the Black Lives, the, the Pride March mm -hmm. was, okay, so I've been, I had severe anxiety going into the March because being a Black trans woman, we are not as protected by the black community as others. So at times, and we are like the ones that they see as a threat as well. So we're just sitting there fighting for all black lives. So it was scary for me to go out there because I was like, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't know, are we going to get hurt? What, what's going to happen, you know? 
but I went and it was it was empowering. Um, had a little incident on a car. Don't sit on cars and protest. You can fall off of them. I know. That's terrible. Yes, yes. I, I was not hurt though, but there is a video of me like really flying off the car. <laughs> so, but it was really empowering to see that many people um, come together. But it was also very disheartening, like for me to see, like we had all these different races and all this other stuff, and to see, like, so everybody has been seeing this problem. We're just now in 2020 talking about it or doing something about it. It's like so for so long, like if we were able to bring all these people in this space. So we all been seeing it. So that's kind of like just shut you up in a bit and like, but you're just happy to be like, okay, we're doing something. But it kind of just made me reflect back like, we could have been did this. Mm. True. Um, they're probably gonna uh, switch interpreters at this point. But um, one of the things we talked about in like preparing for this is like the joy of being one's authentic self. Can you tell me that the joy from that comes from being Naomi? So for me, I would tell people, especially my trans individuals, to find that like there's joy in understanding and realizing your transness and like fully like saying like, okay, this is me. I can fully accept me. I accept like this is what's going on. And and, and just taking that all in. Like I showed you that I have photos where I'll be like, Naomi was coming out and she was letting me know, your time is coming. Your time is coming. And it's just like, you feel so like free in a way of like, I'm not living a lie no more. Mm -hmm. I'm not living for y'all no more. I'm not living for you to be like, oh, okay. A lot of times, well, for me, I really held off my transition because I wanted to succeed at work. I wanted to be taken seriously at work. And there's an interview that came out from RuPaul in like 2013, 2014, where he was like, if you want to be taken seriously, you better wear a suit. And this was like in the midst of me in college and everything like that. And I was just thinking like, that's true. I never seen a trans person in a business, you know, field or you know doing a successful job so i wanted to make sure that if i when i if and when i did transition that i could be comfortable enough to actually use what i went to college for and you know have a job and be able to maintain my own lifestyle but that's that's a harsh reality and so when you are able to do that it's it's this beautiful thing of being able to realize that like, i can be my authentic self i don't have to lie to nobody I don't have to hide it from nobody. I'm able to walk into my job like this. I'm able to walk into my doctor like this. So I feel comfortable walking anywhere like this. And it's a beautiful thing. I love that. I really love that. Um, you are also, and part of the reason for my background is you are a house mother. I am. And so being in that... <laughs> She's my mother. Um, but yes. So, yes. Um, that sense of authenticity, how do you uh, share that with your house children? So for my house kids, I honestly, I'm just going to put it out there, have the best house children, but that's just something. I'm just saying. No, I, my kids, I feel like I, I never chose any of my kids. My kids all choose me. One, but I always wanted my kids to be like go-getters and determined and i feel like i'm i've tried to to display that so that they can see that like i'm always working i'm always doing something um so i kind of just tell them like follow your passions and you know I, i'm here to support you always research what you're doing always make sure that you know the ins and out of the business and what you want to go in or the business that you're doing um, understand the business that you're doing. Um, I just try to get them to understand, like, you have to be a well rounded person. You have to also be constantly growing. And my kids can try me at times and try my spirit. Oh, they would try me. But 
I try to instill it in like, you have to be, I want you to be successful beyond me and beyond ballroom, beyond all of that. I love my, I, like I said, I love my kids beyond ballroom. I don't care about your trophies. I want to know that you are able to succeed in a career and, and be able to afford your lifestyle. And, you know, although that's where we come from and ballroom is really big in our community and I, you know, we all, you know, that's something that we pay homage to. You need to be able to survive now. And what can I do to help you be there, be where you need to be? So whether it's helping you with resumes, helping you find a job, you would have, how can I help you be successful beyond just walking through this truck? Because we're in Wisconsin, let's be honest, the balls are few and far in between. That's true. I'm not the nicest, but <laughs> I'm fair. <laughs> That's interesting. I, um, what is the greatest joy that comes from being a house mother? Um, their successes. Their um, the moments when like you get to get them all together uh, and, and have them in one space, and they're not like all over the place. Um, but seeing like how far they come and you know, what, what what they have planned for the future and, and seeing them like work towards those things and just being true to themselves. So even if they like, you know, they're a goofy one and X, Y, and Z, they didn't change it up where they still being our authentic selves but they're moving towards something, they're succeeding. Like seeing my kids succeed, every time I see a good post, every time I see something good, they take me, I'm like in tears. I'm like, I'm the most dramatic one. I have one who just got a 4.0 in grad school, and I'm just like, my baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you wear many hats. So outside of being a house mother and outside of just being all around fabulous, you do work in advocacy <laughs> and health. Um, mm-hmm. What role do you get out of working in that role? Um, my biggest thing for me, um, I understand that in it needs to be understood that black and brown people have suffered generational, like generational curses of medical mistrust. So my biggest thing for me is working with black and brown individuals to get them linked into health care so that we can learn to not only go to the doctor and we can live healthier lives, but talk to doctors in a language that we understand them and they understand us. Um, <clears throat> So many times we go to the doctor and we um, we go to the doctor and they tell us something and we don't even know what they were talking about. Or we don't ask the questions or we feel like we don't know how to ask the questions or the doctor's talking over our heads and things like that. There's so many people who don't have insurance because they don't even understand how to sign up for insurance. Um, and those were big things that like were alarming to me because talking to someone and be like, oh, so what's your insurance company? And they're like, I don't know, or I don't have insurance. It's really, really alarming to me. And when it comes to working with youth, I feel that this is something that we need to start teaching our youth at an earlier age, how to navigate healthcare system, um, how to understand that you are a customer when you go to the doctor and you need to leave there with adequate care. If you feel like you're being mistreated, then you need to report that Things need to happen, things need to change. Um, and you have the power to do that. And you have the power to, you know, understand it. You're, you're the paying customer and this is your health care. So that's my biggest my biggest mission with my work is just getting people in into health care, understanding that you are in control of your health. And the only way for us to live these longer lives and to push, and, you know, and all these different things, we have to make sure that we're in tune with our doctors. And we need to start pushing for more black and brown doctors. Less than six percent of doctors in the United States are black. So there is rare that we will see a doctor that looks like us who are actually doing our care. So both of those were big my big thing, like navigating for black and brown people to be accepted and brought into these these doctoral programs and these uh, medical programs because we need them. We need doctors who speak our language from our neighborhood. Who inspires you? Um, I have a lot of inspiration. My mother is one of my biggest inspirations. Um, a lot of the women in my family, I come, so the Joneses is all women. 
My aunt had like seven girls. Like it's like all women. So I was raised by a lot of strong black women. Um, and they all like pushed me in ways. Like I come from, I have cousins who are like VPs and, you know, a highly educated women. So they always push me and I always think like, that's how black women carry themselves. So, um, they're not, they're, they don't have attitudes. They just have zest. They, they have a little spice to them. You, you, you got to, you you're gonna get a full you're gonna get a full mouthful of flavor when you go with a black woman. So they are my biggest inspiration. My mom, my cousins, my aunts. They 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 they, like, they come from all different fields. Um, and Beyonce, of course, because how can you not? How can you not? Okay. Just how can you not? Angela Bassett is a big one for me. Um, and black, if I gotta pick one, like one last one, Viola Davis. Mm. It's just they they just walk with such grace and such strength. And just, yeah. mm. That's a good list. <clears throat> I have to ask what's your favorite Beyonce album. Uh, okay, so it would possibly would have to be four. Okay. I like four. Um, I like the tempo of four. I feel like it, it it was where my life was at the time. It fit my life so perfectly in that time. Mm -hmm. And it's so rare that we find albums like that, even if there's not like your favorite artist. It's like some somebody sometimes they have like this album that just fit everything you was going through in your life at that time. You might not like know of the music, but four just was it fit. That's a good one. That's always a question that I sometimes have to judge people <coughs> and pass the test. So it's totally mm. fine. Um, what songs uh, do you sing or listen to when you're looking to find joy? Or artists? When I'm looking to what? Uh, to find joy or to like oh. revel in your joy. Um, okay, so Beyonce. Um. <laughs> Outside of Beyonce, we have Tina Turner, Anita Baker, um, well, let us see, she'll get you where you need to be, um, <laughs> right now, just because I'm on this whole, like, I don't need a man kick, I'm a single black female, successful thing. It's this one song called He and His Feelings by Ruby Rose. <laughs> so that's like my number one right now. Just because that's where I'm at in my life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You don't need a man. Let's talk about love. You did the segue. What is love for Naomi? Love is loving someone unapologetically for themselves. Um, so rather that is, I love this person because they, they snore like crazy, but I love, them. or, um, and, and love looks, looks different. You can love people from a distance. You can love, I feel like love is something I can give everybody. And I lo and that's one thing I love about love is that I don't have to be best friends with somebody for me to love you or for me to wish you well or for me to you know, be praying for you. It's, you just a person. Mm -hmm. So for me, love is just like unapologetically loving or just pushing off positive energy towards people. Like we have so much negativity in the world. We have so much negative things going on. So I don't have to be a part of that. So my love is just not sorry. It's in your face. It's very, you ain't got to like me, but I, I love you. <laughs> Um, what do you think the role of love and joy are in, like, the fight for liberation? You know, whether that be Black liberation or personal sub liberation. Can you hear me? I'm trying to, I don't know if I can go over the air conditioner, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Just one more time. Um, what is the role of love and joy in, like, the pursuit of liberation? And whether that be, like, Black liberation, self-liberation, your own journey with liberation, what are the roles of love and joy in that? 
So for me, like, love is, we have, we, when you go through things in life, you have this theory that you think you can get through, like, by yourself. Like, I don't need nobody. I got this. All this stuff. And especially during COVID, it really made me realize that you need, I need people. I miss hugging people. I miss, you know, not wanting to be, I miss not wanting to be around people. I miss like, you know, just engagement. So my love for me in, in, in the fight for liberation is basically like we finally see each other as humans mm. um, and just people. We're not, we have to see color. We, we see each other's color. We see each other's culture. We, we, we take it all in. Everybody's invited, not just invited to the table, but they got a purposeful seat at the table. Everybody's culture is a part of it everybody get a piece so the only way for us to get to that point is to love each other as just people hey you're you got 300 years worth of hurt this group got 500 years worth of hurt let's bring it to the table and figure out how do we break this down where do we start the apology because that's one of the biggest things a lot of people we we still haven't had any apologies for the, the generational, you know, harm that has been placed on these cultures. So until we are able to sit down and just say like, hey, I love you like I love myself. How can I repair this? How can we build from here? Where do we start? And actually take in what everyone's saying at the table and, and, and create a plan from there and then, yeah, that's where we start. Love that. Your affirmation for today? My affirmation today, I actually said in the mirror today, I was like, today I will be powerful. So, and when I say that, that means beyond just, I'm going to be pretty, or I'm going to make sure I look good today, or I'm going to, it's more of a, I'm going to, whatever I do today, I'm going to do it at 110%. I am going to do all my stuff. I'm going to X, Y, Z, this, I'm going to, you know, dot my eyes and cross my teeth, and I'm just gonna be, I'm gonna be present in everything that I'm doing. So I'm gonna be powerful in those moments. I'm gonna be powerful in those meetings. I will not sit back and feel small. Um, I'm going to, I'm gonna present myself loudly and furiously and get my point across. I'm going to be Shiro today. Oh, I love that. And I can just see, I bet this one, this like mirror is like lit. Oh yeah, I do have a mirror and <laughs> lights. You know, you know, you sit there, you put your hair back. And you sit there and you just, you're going to be powerful today. Mm. I love and it. And you go from there and you just let it roll. You start out with one affirmation and whatever else come out after that, you just go get a roll. With it. Um, if you could cook dinner for any three figures in history... Who would they be? Three singers. Okay. Minnie Rippleton. Um, oh, we can't say they're alive. Right? Yeah. Any, any oh, history. Yeah. It doesn't just have to be singers either. You know. Um, Billie Holiday. I love Billie Holiday. And Audra Beck Down. She played her to the... Oh, my God. Um... But, and my last one would be, I'm kind of torn. I want to say Beyonce, but I love her enough to understand that that conversation just. Oh, I know who I would do. Um, Patti LaBelle. Ooh. I just feel like she got all the old dirt. I just feel like, I just feel like she, but she, I, I do feel she would come in my kitchen and tell me that I'm doing something wrong. Mm. Or I don't have enough sugar. That's such an interesting mix of people. You know, because you do. I'm have, really an old soul. It's, so, people, huh? It's evident. Yeah, like, okay, so people don't know this. A lot of people don't know. But there is a blues singer from Wisconsin, and she's known as Wisconsin Queen of Blues. Her name was Mary Morrow White, and she was my great-grandmother. 
And so she, uh, like, she has two proclamations, two st- two days in Wisconsin that's named after her. Um, and well, she's you know she's still alive, but like we were raised listening to her music. So and she was like she would go on do tours and things like that. So that was really part of my upbringing. So I'm used to listening to like a lot of Etta James and. Um, she has a song like Lou Rawls and things like that. So, yeah. That's so cool. I did not know that about you. Yeah, my grandmother is yeah, part of Wisconsin's history, I guess. That's amazing lineage. I, um, yeah, I like to listen to her at night. I love it. I love it. What brings you joy about being in the lineage of Black women and like just being in community with other Black women? Um, it basically, for me, it empowered me because there was no excuse. I cannot bring nobody in my family, no, not a woman, not my mom, not my aunt. There is no excuse to succeed by all means necessary. Um, and that was the push. It was like successful women, like the way our family full of girls, all the girls are going to be successful. So... I love being able to go and, you know, see my cousins and see, like, oh, my God, like, every, there's these nurses. And you know how like, you always have this thought of, like, what this prominent black family is supposed to look like? And to see, like, oh, the Joneses, but yeah, they look like you go with the Joneses. Because the girls is sick. But, no, I just, it, it empowers me to, like, okay, they, they've been through so much. And they prevail. So you, there is no excuses. Just because it's tough, just because it's hard, just because life threw you this. No. I love it. I love it. Um, let's see which ones I want to ask next. It's so different when we're not moving through each other's houses and being like, what's this paint mean? And, <laughs> um, dream country you want to visit. Um, dream country. I want to go to Egypt. Um, just because I feel like that's going to be like a life changing experience. I would love to. Yeah, I would just stick with Egypt right now. Okay. How do you define beauty? Define what? Beauty. Beauty for me is, how can I say this? It's how you feel. Like, it's just like, you don't, it's, you know, makeup without your hair on. It's, this is me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loving how I change, and I'm changing, and, 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 and my body's changing, and accepting all of you. So, accepting that. My shoulders might be a little wide, and at times in certain dresses, I might look like Tina Turner. But these are my arms. This is my body. This is my face. This is a, and I'm okay with that. And it's like understanding that this is your beauty. This is this is what you have, and and, and just flaunting it and rocking it and being okay with it. Um, yeah, you know, I got muscular arms, but you know what? I used to play basketball. I mean, finding something to laugh about it and, and just your beauty is based on you. And a lot of times we try to build our beauty off what we think this person looks like or what that what that looks like or where that come from or all these different things. And it's like, no, you got to do this for you. You got to you you understand what you're supposed to look like. I'm not gonna look like the next girl. I'm not gonna look like my friend Kennedy. I'm not gonna look like my, my sister Elle. I'm not gonna look like. I'm going to look like Naomi, and Naomi had to figure it out for herself. So I tell everybody, like, your beauty comes from within. Mm-hmm. If you're an ugly person inside, you'll be an ugly person outside. Some of the prettiest people are ugly. That's a word. Some I'm of the ugliest that. people is the most gorgeous. I, knew you was I ain't calling them ugly, ugly, but... You are calling them ugly. I was going to say, I knew you were cutting up with that Tina Turner line. I was just waiting for a moment where you was going to let somebody. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was going to slip. I, I told you. I'm coming. I said, I'm coming off the rip. You know, so I, my, my new line is I used to play with the WNBA. It's okay. 
go-to for a good laugh? What is your go-to for a good laugh? My go-to for a good laugh is TikTok. Okay, for real. Um, or Pretty V. Um, if anybody, if from Wisconsin, no, Ricardo Wynn. Anything that she has posted is not to the ten hilarious because she just my mother has issues. Um, but yes, TikTok is like the you want to take your mind off something, you want to laugh. Or I think about like nine things that I said today that I know I should not have possibly said. <laughs> and that usually gets me there. Like if anybody, like if you want somebody to say something that's not supposed to be said or like if there's something awkward happening, Naomi don't like it and Naomi's going to say something. You know, I'm going to be over there. Well, the elephant in the room is telling me and then whoosh. I told y'all I'm still working on me. <laughs> so I have a, just a couple more questions and I'd like to open it up and kind of um, okay. talk to the other. I'm having fun. Y'all can ask all the questions y'all want to. Just don't ask me what's in the bank. <laughs> None of your business. I'm a Christian. If your life were a song, what would the title be? Uh. Da -da 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 um, this is gonna sound so bad, but it's just like where I am right now because I, I work a lot. It's the city girls' jobs, yes. <laughs> I just because I feel like I just work so much, I'm always in like a meeting, I'm always doing something. I am the job, I am the job, you know, all that. that's where I'm at right now, <laughs> yeah. And I hear it in the background, which makes it that much more funnier. <laughs> it was going to be my theme music, and I was going to walk out, and it was going to, you know, I was going to have a fan. I was going to do it all. I, I, you know, I had production. See, I was ready. I was early. I got here at 45. You did. You were early. Um, you, at least they never late. If you could... What's your dream dream? Like your dream without any restrictions, any barriers. What is your dream dream? Okay, so you are trying to raid me after this. Okay, when I originally went to college, my dream was to get my MRS degree. And for those who don't know what that means, that meant to go to college and find a husband and, and be married and have kids. That was originally my plan when I went to college. Did not span out that way, right? So, kind of, you know, you graduate from that and then start working and you know, X, Y, Z. But my overall dream in life is to have a family. I, I want to have a family and my overall goal in, like, career-wise is to be a philanthropist full time. So, raise money for different organizations. Um... Because I feel like the only way for us to build up our black and brown organizations, we really have to start looking at our fundraising departments and really start like structuring them a little better that we can actually bring in revenue to keep our programs long lasting. So many black and brown started organizations go under because they only solely depend on governmental funding and they don't look at any other funding beyond that. And we lose so much of our grants change every day and programs change. So we lose staff and people lose their job and, and programs and, and things like that. And I would like to work with organizations specifically around like creating other levels of income that they're able to sustain if those things were to happen. Who you just gave me an idea? Let me go on here because my consultancy. <laughs> I gave you a mark and an idea today. I'm proud of myself. Yes. Question before we um, open it up. How do you know when you're feeling joy? What does it feel like to you? It's like a loss in time. So it's just like I don't ever want it to end. It's like a, I'm here. I'm here. Like I'm here in this moment. I'm here in this space. I'm here in this time. I'm here in whatever it looks like for you. But for me, it's really taking in that moment and understanding like 
this is happiness. This, even if this is happiness only lasts for like three minutes, three seconds, you had a moment of something beautiful. So that's joy. I love it. I lied. So there's one more question. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for next month, we're kind of having a big read. And you and I talked about the book that we're going to read, which is uh, Redefining Realness by Jane and Rock. Um, yeah. So you read the book, right? Yes. Do you love it? Do you like it? What's your feelings on it? I I do. However, one thing I tell people a lot of times, when you're taking in other people's perspective, also remember that you're taking in their perspective from their area, their climate, their their, their environment, things like that. And I'll, I'll see, like, on a lot, because I'm one of those people who like to read books, but I also like to go on, like, the little social media realm and, like, read what other people think and stuff like that. I'm, I'm a nerd real bad. So anyway... Um, I go on there, like, you see people like, well, I don't understand this, or I don't get this, and I have to, like, also take this to my mind, or, like, well, that don't really fit me, or I don't really understand how that works, because I haven't had that experience, but I also have to look at, this is someone else's experience, this is their lot lived experience, so I do love the book, and it does have, like, a lot of lessons, and it also tells, I feel like a lot of people should read it, because it teaches you some, some basis on how to talk to people. Who are who don't identify just like you, um, which is a big thing. But yeah, I just feel like you gotta also take it with the understanding that this might not be your experience, and that's okay. That's okay. Just somebody else's experience, but validate their experience and see like what can you learn in your experience from them. I love that. That's like a really good summary of the book. Title of your autobiography. <laughs> we'll open it up. <laughs> <laughs> you said what? I said title. The title of my autobiography. Yeah. Um. um uh, I was gonna say something, but it was gonna be very inappropriate, so I'm not gonna say that. Um. <laughs> we want to be back on the air. No. <laughs> um. I would say I am. Because I feel like if I was to write an autobiography about myself, I would have to break down all the different hats and statues of my life. And um, I am so many different things. And I feel like that phrase just encompasses all of that. What is she probably trying to get me in truck? Did you see that? Uh uh. <laughs> And the shy folks can stay off too, so. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, I just wanted to break it in to see, you know, if folks who were watching had any questions they wanted to add to the conversation. Um, this is Black and Brown Trans Joy, but obviously we're all in a shared space together to learn and be in joy with each other, so. I had one question to, to get us rolling a little bit. So um, a lot of times in trans communities and in black and brown communities, we talk about representation. And I'm curious, uh, Naomi, where or if you find joy in any kind of representation that's currently in our world. Um, I feel that it's, as long as, when it comes to representation, as long as they're representing us in a way that it is positive for the community, um, for, at this moment, that's all that we can take right now. Um, for so long in like media, we have been portrayed as like these, like disgusting jokes and things like that. So like now that we're being taken seriously, I feel like we need to be taken seriously for a while before we can actually get to a point where like, anything trans can be like something that we laugh about um like there we we want to get to a place where like you know we're we could be part of like the the joking community and things like that but right now in representation as long as it's positive for us it shows us in the right light i feel it's 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 great but it's such a, a, a crazy slope because in one instance that could just go out the window they it, we could be publicized in a way that is so damaging and it can just change so quickly so i say when it comes to representation it needs to be very very careful i 
I seen a question at the bottom. I can't see. The um, the Michael asked um, about like would pose be one of those examples or not? Would, would pose be a, one of those positive or examples of positive representation? Um, I believe it is okay. So I feel ways okay. So pose is a very positive, you know, representation of trans people, especially during. Also, like I said about the Janet Mock book, we need to remember that these are placed in time periods. These are also placed in certain contexts environmentally, climate-wise, New York, this is not. So we always got to take all of that in when we are watching and, and taking in things. I love Pose because there's so many historical references um, that are in the show. If, if you watch Paris is Burning, if you keep up with those, those um, LGBT history things, you can see them when the show comes on. So that's one thing I do love, and it's like a way of reconnecting our younger communities with our ballroom history. Um, so I do find it as a positive representation. The things that's happening in the media with the stars is something that I don't want it to be one of those things that turn people away from the show, because I do believe it is a positive representation. But as we all know, the situation going on with Billy Porter and the other stars is something that trans people have dealt with a lot of times when it comes from the rest of the LGB community. A lot of times when it's, you need us to be the poster child, we're there and we're present, but when it's time for recognition, we're no one to, nowhere to be found and those who were on our coattails don't advocate for us. This is Matthew. Naomi, do you think there does there exist about like a narrative about being black and trans in the Midwest or in Milwaukee specifically? Um, I did not think so until like I met people from different <laughs> states um, who, who had this thought. Um, well, a lot of people at first, some reason think that there's no black people in Wisconsin. That's one. That's the biggest one. Um, and Although Wisconsin has its really, really big problems, when it comes to trans health, looking at other states, they are very much so more advanced in a lot of places. Um, so that's one big thing. Um, a lot of people think like, oh, y'all get all the parts up there in the north. Feel like that, like not exactly, but in certain states, like we do get better resources because we're up here. So that's one of the biggest ones. Um, yeah. That's one of the big, yeah. There's some other ones, but we ain't gonna talk about that. This is Matthew. Naomi, do you think there, does there exist about like a narrative about being black and trans in the Midwest or? in Milwaukee specifically? Um, I did not think so until like, I met people from different <laughs> states um, who, who had this thought. Um, well, a lot of people at first, some reason think that there's no black people in Wisconsin. That's one. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest one. Um, and although Wisconsin has its really, really big problems, when it comes to trans health, looking at other states, they are very much so more advanced in a lot of places. Um, so that's one big thing. Um, a lot of people think like, oh, y'all get all the parts up there in the north. I feel like that, like not exactly, but in certain states, like we do get better resources because we're up here. So that's one of the biggest ones. Um, yeah, that's one of the big, yeah. There's some other ones, but we ain't gonna talk about that. So as, as people are still thinking of, of conversational um, topics, I had another question around, um, I think that, you know, kind of like what you were saying, like, I think a lot of times people don't think of Milwaukee or as Wisconsin as 
um, a place where there's a ball scene. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what Milwaukee or Wisconsin's ball scene is like, maybe compared to other parts of the country. What's the history? How long has it been around? I mean, any of those pieces that you may know or may know of that um, you're willing to share with folks? Um, so Wisconsin's ballroom history, it's starting to get its life back for a for several years, it had become non-existent. But Wisconsin history, uh, ballroom history goes back a while. Like we have um, one of the first major houses in Wisconsin was the House of Kennedy, and this was like in the early 2000s. Um, and these people who founded these houses and, and started, which House of Kennedy was an organization, um, and did a lot of work working with the state of Wisconsin. Um, were founded by SGL men, and these men are still present in Milwaukee's community. They still work heavily in Milwaukee's community. Um, the House of the Mirror um, was another big one, and the person, um, people who founded those houses still work heavily in this community. Um, it just became, it. there were so many things that was going on during the time, like the, around like 2013 to 2017, 18, that it kind of just pushed people away from ballroom. We didn't become a focus for a while. Um, and that's another reason why I am kind of, I am happy about Pose because with it being gone for so, for so many years, um, our young community didn't know about it. So they were able to give some knowledge about it and actually like help us rebirth this, this, whole, this whole community of ballroom and, and, and want to create the ball and want to learn the history and things like that. I think one of my favorite memories of Joy with you was when we did the ball the two years ago now, a year ago. Uh, the, la last year. Wait, no, no, no. It was early, early January, every early February twenty nineteen. Okay, you're right. You're right. You're right. And like what that was like. Um... Oh, there's another question now in the chat box. Can you see it? We had fun at the ball. We did. Uh, and then after the ball, it was more fun. Now I've seen the fun of social media with the prevalence of truth and content, especially lately. Um, so one of the big things about balancing with social media is if you feel like you can get a negative reaction, more than likely it will. Um, so don't post it. Two, um... I always tell people, find a therapist, not Facebook. Like you can, you, the world does not need to know about the situation that happened at work. Um, or you don't have to name everybody that happened at work. Or, you know, it's, it's like we have to be more, we have a, a understanding and a consciousness of knowing like, this is going to start some feathers. This is going to start a pot. And if you know that, you can take responsibility of knowing, like, I, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. Because especially during these times, you can say something and it can be so triggering. It can be um, so earth-shaking because it, it, it can change your, your relationships. It can change, your, like, your, your friendships at work. It can just people look at you in a totally different way just based on the things that you said. And you probably didn't even mean it that way. Or you probably, everything may I during this time, everything is 10 times worse than what you originally meant it to be. So I always tell people, think carefully. Don't wear your emotions on your Facebook. Um, unless it's like something, you know, very simple, something soft. But yeah. Find a therapist, not Facebook. It will save you a lot of time. Okay. Some of my favorite black and brown trans authors. Um, Janet Mock. Um, just because I love hearing her point of view coming from Hawaii and, you know, during that time period and things like that. Um, all of my favorite authors, okay, just because I'm trans, I mean, I just, I don't know, we're just only so trans books. 
I love a, a whole category of authors, but right now my favorite author just so that's the mood I'm in. Um, it's Warsan Shire. Uh, every Warsan Shire book is my favorite book. Um, she's absolutely amazing. I am currently rereading um, Jill Scott's book as well. I'm one of those people who like read half the book, start another book, and go back and read the rest of the book. So I'm reading that one. I'm reading, rereading Janet Mock's book again. And what else? I'm reading another book. I was reading another book. I stopped, obviously. <laughs> oh, Coldest Winter Ever. Rereading that one. That's for my urban readers. Good book, very good book. Graphic, but very good book. Did folks have any other questions? Oh. Um, relationships with joy. Um, no, my relationships with joy have shifted often. Um, what made you happy at 20 don't make you happy at 27. What made you happy at 21 is not going to make you happy at 30. I feel like joy is, joy is not complacent. It's always growing and evolving. And like I said, like the things that made you happy before don't make you happy anymore. I feel like finding joy is that, that understanding of I will continuously have to figure out what makes me happy. And when it doesn't make me happy, Find what makes me happy because I want to be happy. Um, and that's just that for me, we have these ideas like this is how we want to feel like what we felt like when we were 16 and it ain't going to happen. But joy for me is continuously knowing that what I, what I like at 20 is going to evolve at 27. And, and I need to be evolving with that. If I'm not evolving in the same things that I'm liking that I liked when I was two years ago, that's problematic. Y'all gotta excuse me. I'm busting out the glisten. <laughs> it's all this hair. We started out tonight with Matthew dabbing, and then now you've got some glisten, and... Yeah, it's like the light, because I got lighting now. As you can see, there's lighting, there's lights. I, I really, for some reason, thought I was doing the Real Housewives of Atlanta reunion, and I might head phone in every, like, I'm ready. Mine is just genetics. I don't have any glamorous stories. Look, Next time, I'm going to be like, you know, I want everyone to wear all white to give the illusion. Girl. Oh, Matthew, you know, your skin with white will be everything. I know, but my sweat with white would be just a nightmare. Who are you so. telling? Because my sweat in this black is... is... You, you have to also remember, you know, hormones send you through menopause and... um. Whew. It's just getting hotter and hotter, I'm about to say. Thank you, girl. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. Does sweating bring you joy? Oh. It does not. Um, I don't like anything. Okay, so I am, I don't like sweat. I don't like outside. I don't like the smell of outside. It's just horrendous. Um, and if you think there's no smell that outside doesn't smell like anything, something's wrong with you. Outside has a smell. Um, I don't like bugs. I'm very much so an inside person, an inside central air person. Whenever I have to go out in nature, that's a problem for me. Because nature does not like me. If I go outside, I'm going to get stung by a bee. That's just my theory in life. And I'm not ready to like you know die of a bee sting yet. Are there any last questions or comments? 
Oh. If there are not. Uh, oh, if there are no other questions or comments, we should do a go around of gratitude. Um, if folks would like, can you give me a thumbs up if that's something you'd be interested in? Yeah. Okay. Naomi, do you want to start um, our go around of gratitude? What is one thing you're grateful for from today? For me, I, I'm happy that you guys invited me to hold space, um, to speak my truth, um, to, speak, to speak from my perspective. There are so often that trans women are not invited to the table to just speak on the happiness of being trans rather than the disparities of being trans. So I thank you and I am internally grateful for this opportunity to be able to sit here with you all. And, you know, to sit here and, and take it all of Matthew's, you know, black boy joy and all of this just, it, it, it means a lot for me. Thank you. Matthew, thank you for facilitating tonight's um, conversation. It's, uh, it's really beautiful to see you in that role of um, gentle, playful, fun. Um, not that I don't see you in that. And, and Naomi, you are like, freaking contagious in your your positiveness and um you know you said you were an old soul and i was like you're an old soul soul with puppy energy so like i just like i have been smiling this whole time because it just like i just feel oh, it you know, out in the world and um it's really really beautiful so thank you for for being you and and sharing thank you I'm thankful, this is going to sound bad, but it's good. I'm just thankful that we got through it because it's just been a long week. So I was excited that today happened. And I'm always kind of nervous about, you know, um, just the webinar thing is so new to me. So I'm, I'm thankful that we, we got through it and my sweat didn't like pour into my eyes. And I'm always thankful <laughs> for time to kind of have conversation with you. I know I miss you, um, Naomi, in this pandemic. So I know. We're gonna have to do bridge as soon as this week as soon as we can. As soon as we can. <laughs> Look, I learned how to make vegan meals now. You you know they don't have to be vegan. I'm just working on not eating meat right now. <laughs> well, I'm trying to, you know, I'm working on, you know my I'm trying to get my arms down to, you know, a Beyonce, not a Tina. Girl. All is good for the order then. Thank you again, Naomi, and thank you all for coming. Um, have a wonderful night. Thank you. Anytime. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> thank you all. See ya.